Bibles, if you will, if you have them, to uh, Acts chapter 28. And uh, I thought I was going to finish tonight. I'm not. But before I do that, let me give you a couple announcements also. Uh, no Thursday study next week. That's July 5th, I believe. And in two weeks, we will actually have our next study, which I will finish, and you'll hear me say this again, the book of Acts in two weeks. And so that, that'll be our very last one. Uh, also, in those two weeks, right after our study, we're going to have an Israel meeting. So right after our study, there'll be an Israel meeting, Israel-Rome, those of you who are going. All right, if you're in Acts chapter uh, 28, this is our 79th week. I, talked, I told you that I titled it The End of the Beginning, uh, 79 Weeks of Study. I want to give you a little perspective on how long you've been studying Acts and what it means. That's a total of 119 total hours if you've been here every one for Acts. That's 7,110 total minutes. Now consider this, the average college course takes 1,700 minutes, or about 24 total hours, to complete. So you have studied Acts to the equivalent of taking five complete college courses almost one full year of college. And so, onward to your degree, right? And some of you go to Wednesday nights and Thursday night studies. Some of you go to both. And uh, you view them, or you view them on Facebook or on YouTube. That's over 10 complete college courses on Proverbs. We'll take much over, more than 80 weeks. And 79 weeks on actually 80 with the next one we do. You only need 24 classes for a four-year college degree. You're about a halfway there in your Bible classes for those. And consider this. If you want to really talk about college, that first chart to the left, and you see that 62%, only 62% of graduates of college had a job requiring a college degree. So 62% only. And only 27% on the right side had a job related to their major. So they paid to go to college, they spent all that time there, and only 27% actually have a job when they get out in the real world that's related to their major. But you can apply 100% of what you studied in Acts directly to your life. 100%. So I think you've done the wise thing in being here. And not only that, there's some college courses that are only theories. May not even be factual. But you have been studying the complete truth. Aren't you glad you've come to, Wednesday, to Thursday night Bible studies? So, amen. So, as I continue to wind down, it'll be this week, and again, we'll skip a week, and then next week I'll give you the final one, uh, which will really be a summation of everything. I want to give you a couple facts just to, just to refresh you and bring you around a little bit. These are called Facts About Acts, is what I gave them. So you have the author is Luke, you've known that. It's completed prior to Paul's trial in 60 AD, Luke completes it. It's the 44th book of the Bible, it's the 5th book in the New Testament. So 44 is the number of earthly things. So it's a very earthly book. It takes you to that numerology. It takes you through very earthly situations. Five is the number of grace. And you see grace all through the book of Acts. You also know this. There's 22 books follow it. It's the first and only book of history in the New Testament. It is totally a book of history. It tells you the history of the church, just like a historian would. It has 28 chapters. It has 1,007 verses. And it has 24,250 words. I know it's off the page, but that's how many it has. Let me give you this. Uh, the last recorded words of Jesus prior to his ascension back to, that's spelled wrong, back to heaven as recorded in the book of Acts. Acts 1.8, you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, is the last words, and in Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. That's the last thing Jesus said before he ascended on earth, uh, from the earth. The book of Acts is the record of that commission being carried out. Acts 1.8 is the book of Acts in miniature. They bring the word to Jerusalem. They bring it to Judea and Samaria, 8. 8, 5 to 12, 25, and to the ends of the earth, Acts chapter 13 to chapter 28. We know as we continue to go on, the book of Acts is the historical link between the bio biographical records of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and the epistles. Acts is an extremely important book that is also shows what the death of Jesus accomplished, the means of forgiveness through the blood of Christ, the means of inclusion through baptism. Everybody wants to talk about inclusion today. And obedient believers being added to the church. And by the way, definitely daily and sometimes multiplied. The book of Acts begins with the year of Christ's death, 30 AD. It ends following the two years of Paul's imprisonment at Rome, about 62 AD. It covers the first 30 to 35 years of the history of the church, the full history of the church. It's the only book in the Bible that asks the question, what must I, be, what must I do to be saved? And then provides the answer. And then we see the facts about Acts this way. 
Uh, the book of Acts records the case examples of conversion. 3,000 on the day of Pentecost, 237. The Samaritans' conversions. Simon the sorcerer converted. The Ethiopian eunuch converted by Philip. Saul or Paul's conversion. Uh, Cornelius and his household. Lydia and her household. The Philippian jailer and his family. The Corinthians and the 12 men at Ephesus. It tells us about those conversions. We'll talk about that a little later on in our study. One other, another set of, the, of, of facts about Acts. Through the first 12 chapters, the major character is Peter. Through the final 16 chapters, it is Paul. Acts record three missionary journeys of Paul. First journey, journey of Acts lasted two years, traveled 2,581 miles. Second journey in Acts, uh, fifth, chapter 15, 18, lasted three years, travels 3,050 miles. Third journey in Acts, lasts four years, travels 3,307 miles. Re then to Rome, lasted one year, 2,344 miles. For a total of 10 years, he was on really the road giving the gospel. 11,280, there's a zero missing miles, 11,280. So this is an amazing book. It's giving us the history. By the way, how long does it take you if you want to read right through it? Well, 79 weeks, no. It takes you this. How long it takes you if you read the book of Matthew straight through 2.5 hours. Mark will take you an hour and a half. Luke will take you two and a half hours. John will take you two hours. And Acts will take you two and a quarter hours. Now, why did I tell you that? Because they're important books. They're the most important books you can read. Everybody asks me, where should I start in my Bible? Start with these books. You want to read the Gospels, Jesus' words. You want to read Acts. It's just like a Gospel. Why? Because even though the other books are great and they're wonderful and we need those, this, you can read through them pretty quick. Uh, we can go through Galatians in 20 minutes, Ephesians 20 minutes, Philippians 14 to read through, Colossians 13, 1 Thessalonians 12, 2 Thessalonians 7, 1 Timothy 16, Timothy, 2 Timothy 11, Titus 11, Philemon 3, Hebrews 45 minutes, James 16, 1 Peter 16, uh, 2 Peter uh, 10, and it goes on and on. And I'm not give you the rest of them, but we're in the final chapter of the book of Acts. We've taken our time with it because it's a story and it's a history and you need to hear all about it. The total reading times of Acts, again, is somewhere in the neighborhood of about 2.25 2 hours if you want to just read it straight through. You have taken 79 weeks to read every single word in the book of Acts and study those words. No different than we're going to do tonight. So tonight, we will finish, start to finish, because uh, we have two left, this one and the next one, the story with the final chapter. This is the final chapter. And by the way, there's something down the bottom of that that really continues it. It's disciples making disciples. Acts was never meant to stop. It was meant to continue on with you and with me. You are the history of the church. You are the next generation. You are the next one taking it to the next group of people. So let's pick up what we've, we've talked about last week just a little bit. I want you, first of all, to see Paul's Rome. Paul's brought to Rome, and it's the most magnificent city I think that the world ever saw, to be honest with you. Uh, if I took you there in the structures back then, uh, your eyes would just gouge out, you'd pop out because it's so beautiful. And Paul would see some of Rome that we know, but he also would not see some of them. He would see the Roman Forum. And this is a recreation of the Roman Forum. By the way, this is the seat of their Senate. This would be equivalent to our Washington, D.C. So Paul sees this. He's never seen anything like this in his entire life. He's probably heard about it, but he's never seen it. To the right-hand side there is actually the Senate. And so that's where they would meet. That's where they decide laws. Orators would give talks from that, from that middle part. As a matter of fact, uh, Mark Antony would give the eulogy for Julius Caesar right there. When we go to Rome, I'll show you the spot Mark Anthony sat on, to, give the, to stood on, to give the, the eulogy. I'll show you the spot where Caesar's coffin would lay when he would do that. So we know that uh, he would also see this. This was also constructed. This is the Hippodrome. Uh, it's on the Palatine, uh, Palatine Hill. It's called the Circus Maximus. And this is where this, the horses would, would race. Yes, they had horse racing. It would be like our Kend Kentucky Derby on steroids. And what they would do is they'd obviously have an amazing time. By the way, gladiators also raced horses. The way they got the horses to race is they put mirrors on both ends and they do it during the sunlight. And when the sun hit the mirrors, it would hit the horses eyes and send them crazy and they race fast. And so you have a, a, a huge, this seats somewhere in the neighborhood about uh, 82,000 people. And so this is something that's, that's huge. And then I'm going to give you a little shock today. He would see this. Anybody know what that is? You should know from Birmingham, Alabama, you should know what that is. That's a temple. It's the temple of Vesta. Let me show it to you again. That's in Sh on Shades Mountain. Temple of Vesta, Shades Mountain. Vestavia, Temple of Vesta, Vestavia. That's the actual temple, the man that built it. Built it in 1928. He was the mayor of the city. He was a millionaire and philanthropist by the name of George Batty Ward. 
He built it because he had traveled all over, all over Europe and he saw the Temple of Vesta. And then when he saw that, he wanted to build his house around that. And then the one you see from Shades Mountain, from the mountain, you see this. That's the Temple of, of, that's the temple of Sybil. Temple of Vesta. Vesta was the goddess of the home and the hearth and the fire. And uh, we know that Sybil uh, was the mother goddess. And so when you drive down, have you ever saw this, temp this temple? That's on Shades Mountain. Mountain. So you've seen that. Paul would see that also. Uh, he would not see this. Uh, this is the Arch of, of uh, Titus, and let me show you where this is, and, and this is the Roman form, but when he saw it, there was nothing here. This is the Arch of Titus. That wouldn't be built until about eight years after Paul, actually right after 70 AD, about 72. Titus destroys Israel. He's the one that came down and burned the temple down. In order to honor his conquest, they built this arch. Now, when you go there, you'll see it. It's there. And the interesting thing, if Paul would have seen it, he would have realized, recognized ex exactly what it was because on that arch is what they carried away and there is the menorah. So they carried away from the temple. That golden menorah came back to Rome. So Paul never saw that. How many want to go to Rome? He would also see this. He would see the Basilica of Julia and Julia and actually Amelia. They were uh, later to be converted. Both those, these, that's right over here. Those are basilicas. And by the way, this gives us, these were before Paul. He would see them. They were built somewhere in about 20 BC. They were temples to gods. And you and I and America and all the world builds our churches based on that, on that type of design. Most big churches have one main aisle that goes down, especially Catholic churches. And they have two sub-aisles, one here, one there, separated by columns. That's a basilica. What they would do, Christians, to tell you how, how powerful Christians were, by 352, all the gods would be taken off of here and crosses would be put up. It became Christianized with Constantine. So we know that Paul doesn't see that because, or he does see that. He doesn't see this, and it's really kind of, I think God spared him from not seeing this. That's the Colosseum. The Colosseum won't be built until about, uh, about 80, 80, it'll be finished in 80 AD. He doesn't see the Colosseum, and I'm really actually thankful he doesn't see it. It's an amazing masterpiece, a masterwork. And in the Colosseum, even though when we go to Rome, our guide will no doubt try to tell us that Christians weren't killed there, I will look at him and say, you're crazy. Because Christians were killed there, it's, it's, re, it's recorded everywhere. And I'm glad Paul didn't see it because they would crucify Christians in the Colosseum and they would berate, berate them and they would bring wild animals to tear them apart in front of the 80,000 spectators. And so Rome was in its heyday and Paul had a bird's eye view under house arrest inside Rome. And he was probably arrested and put in the Palatine prison, which we know he was, and the Mamertine prison, excuse me, and that's right in front of the forum. So if he's in that prison, he has a bird's eye view of the forum. A house is over that, was over that prison. We will see the prison, the actual chains, by the way, that Paul was chained to. We won't see the house. It's gone. But this would be his view from his house, overlooking the forum. So Paul is in a spot that's, that's technologically advanced. It's social, societally advanced. It's, it's advanced in every way. And he's bringing something that they've never heard of before. It's here he calls for the Jews of Rome to hear him out. These Jews are sophisticated Jews. They're affluent Jews. They are living in one of the most powerful city in the world. They're very, very rich, and they have, a, they have a synagogue that's there. So Paul, as his custom is, and you told you this last week, would go to the Jews first, always to the Jews first. After he tells them why he's there and why he's under arrest, uh, they say this to him. I'm just reviewing quickly. They said this. They reply, we have had no letters from Judea or reports against you from anyone who has come here. But we want to hear what you believe. For all. The only thing we know about this movement that's Christianity, is that it's denounced everywhere. They go on and say this to him. This is last week. So time was set, and on that day, a large number of people came to Paul's lodging. He explained and testified about the kingdom of God and tried to persuade them about Jesus from the scriptures, using the law of Moses and the books of the prophets. And it goes on to say this. He spoke to them from morning until evening. That's how we ended last week. Now, tonight, we're going to pick it up where we left off last week. Tonight, I want to title this, The Three D's of Dullness, D-U-L-L-N-E-S-S. Acts chapter 8, 28, verse 24 starts us out. It says this. And some believe the things which were spoken, and some believe not. So some of these Jews, and by the way, they're probably overlooking the forum. It's probably a beautiful day. He's there, and he's, he's speaking to them morning, and the, the setting is unbelievable. And he's talking about Jesus in the midst of all the gods that are there, and in the midst of the God that they worship that's different than those gods. They already know that they have a step up on all, all the pagan Romans. They're circumcised. The Romans aren't. They probably think that they want to be able to reach the Romans with, with Judaism. And so Paul gives them even another god, and the one that really is the fulfillment 
of the gods that the, of the prophets that they're that they're listening to. So he verse 24 tells us that that there's a mixed crowd. It tells us that the response to what he told them was mixed. Some believed, some rejected it. He's going to explain, as I told you last week, Messiah, probably in every book of the Old Testament, leading them right up to who Christ was and what he did for him and what he's doing around the world. Verse 24 tells us of this mixed response to Jesus. Some were persuaded and some disbelieved. That's typical of what this powerful, persuasive evangelist experienced all over his travels with the Jews. Every time he spoke to the Jews about Jesus, this is typical of what they did. I showed you a chart when we started the 10 major uh, conversions underneath Paul's preaching. That's Paul's preaching. And Peter's on top of there. And, and um, we know that Philip did one of them also. That's Paul mostly uh, teaching and preaching. These are the conversions that happened. They were being converted everywhere. And these are just the ones that are mentioned. But I didn't show you the ones that rejected Paul. All through Acts, here's the ones that rejected him. We know the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem in Acts 4 rejected him. The examples of non-conversion in Acts. Stephen's here has rejected Stephen. Elmaeus, island of Cyprus, rejected Paul. The Jews of Antioch, Poseidon, had rejected Paul. The Jews in Iconium rejected Paul. The Jews in Thessalonica rejected Paul and followed him to Jerusalem to try to kill him. The Athenians uh, rejected Paul. They were too smart. The Jews in Corinth rejected him. There were Jews in Ephesus that rejected him. The Jerusalem mob in Jerusalem rejected him. Felix and Drusilla, Drusilla rejected him. Agrippa almost was persuaded, but he rejected him. And the Jews of Rome. The Bible says some believed the things were spoken and some disbelieved. So I want you to understand that everybody you talk to to give Jesus to is not going to accept you. You need to know that right off the bat. It's not like just because you're showing them something, they're going to say, oh yeah, that's great, I'll accept that. No, you're going to have a mixed review. Jesus had mixed reviews. Listen, we know, let me show you the, those, let me, let me show you those who disbelieved right there. Let me give you a case in point that it's the same way all the way down through Acts. But before they depart, Paul, grieved by the, his, their disbelief, he's grieved, repeats a passage from Isaiah, and it is a tough one. He tells this to the Jews, and let me tell you something. You talk about putting a nail straight in. He's going to tell them this. Acts chapter 28, verse 25 to 27. So when they did not agree among themselves, they departed after Paul and said one to another, the Holy Spirit spoke, spoke rightly through Isaiah. And, Paul, and Paul, they departed after Paul had said one word or one phrase. The Holy Spirit spoke rightly, he's, Paul's quoting, through Isaiah the prophet to our fathers, saying, go to this people and say, hearing you will hear and shall not understand. And seeing, you shall see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull, he says. Their eyes are hard of hearing. Their ears they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. Paul said, you are what Isaiah talked about. You're the ones Isaiah quoted. You are disbelievers. You have dull hearing. You have, you have eyes that won't see. It's right before you. The implication is that Paul believed this passage accurately described his listeners that very day. Paul's point was to show the leaders that they had come to the dreadful stage of religious dullness. And let me tell you something. As the truth be known, there's a lot of people who sit in Christian churches that are dull. They're in a religious dullness. They go to church, they go through the functions, they go through the motions, but basically they don't understand. The switch hasn't come on. Come on, somebody say amen. So they heard the words, but they didn't understand. They saw the truth, but they wouldn't respond. Their emotions were insensitive, and their ears were weary of great ideas which they had not lived. The tragic result of their faithless familiarity was that they were no longer able to receive truth and order their lives around it. When you get to the point, or I get to the point, where we come to church and we're not excited by what the Word of God's going to do in our lives, we become dull. It becomes just a function to us. We should come saying, there's something here today that I should receive. And by the way, if you kick the Holy Spirit out of church, then you will be dull. Because it's the Holy Spirit that does it. And in America, all over America today, the Holy Spirit's being kicked out of churches, and all we're doing is gathering people together. And I don't care if you fill, fill a church with 20,000 people. I would take one fired up person than 20,000 dull people. Because the dull aren't going to do anything for God. The fired up one's going to change their lives. Okay, so... What happened was their traditions, most of all their traditions and their customs, their rules, they had the right God. They had the right doctrine. They had the right Old Testament. They had the right Pentateuch. They had the right prophets. They missed Christ when he came because they thought he was going to come their way. They thought it was going to be what they wanted. They had resisted so long that they couldn't receive anything. There was no longer a desire or a need for God's healing love, no longer a desire for his forgiveness. They were even questioning whether there was an afterlife. You had Sadducees that didn't even believe you went to heaven. And so they're really messed up. Religion will mess you up. I got a letter uh, yesterday from a lady 
uh, she was from Florida, I was telling somebody, uh, she was trying to get me, she was trying to send me an offering for three years, she kept getting the wrong address. She finally sent me an offering, she said that she was, uh, well, he's a young girl, she was in the kibbutz in 1964, met her Jewish, a Jewish a man, married him, Jewish boy, uh, she's living in Florida right now, and she was telling me pretty much about, about her excitement for God, she's a, she's a, she was a former Catholic, and how she listens to this, she'll probably listen to this tonight, and how she listens to this and how she's so fired up about it. Uh, she said something that was pretty funny, I don't know if I should even repeat it. She said, my husband is a good man, he golfs and he watches TV, I, I don't like golf and I don't like TV. So obviously she's watching this, you know, but I watch her passion to, to, try, to try to reach somebody for three years. She sent me $700, I don't know this lady. She says, I want you to help them. I want it to help the ministry. Persistent. Why? What does that? That's not me doing that. That's the Holy Spirit prompting people to do things like that. The Holy Spirit is the prompter. You get him out of a church, and your church is dead and dull. And so I want you to understand that we're watching it today. We're watching it in America. So status of the people of God had excluded God. These were the people of God, and they've excluded God. These were the chosen people, and they forgot why they were chosen. You know why they're called the chosen people? They were chosen to bear the Messiah. That's why they were chosen. They were the group that God called to bear the Messiah. They were chosen to have the Messiah. Man, how many people are like that even in our churches today? They, they would, wouldn't know God if they stumbled, if you sat next to him in the pew. Christians in name only. Amazingly, Jesus used the same verse from Isaiah to those non-believing Jews who heard him speak. Listen to what he said. He has blinded their eyes, talking about the enemy, and hardened their hearts so that they would not see with their eyes and perceive with their heart and be converted and I heal them. Jesus said the same words that Paul said to the unbelieving Jews. Paul goes on in Acts chapter 28, verses 28 and 29. I'm going someplace because I want to finish this out with a message tonight. Therefore, let it be known to you that the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. Now, mark that down in your Bibles. Paul says, we came to you. God wanted to come to you first. You rejected it, so get ready. This salvation is going to the Gentiles. And so, you wouldn't be saved tonight if he didn't say that. He was a prophet to the Gentiles. Even though he went to the Jews first, he recognized that, he, that they were the Gentiles were, were grabbing it more than the Jews were who should have. He says, and they will hear it. And he was absolutely right. He's prophesying. The Gentiles have heard it. The, the number of Gentile com, com, converts to the gospel even today is supposedly, you ready for this, half the world population. 50% of the world population say they're Christians. 50%. And so, listen to what goes on. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had a great dispute among themselves. There's three D's. Those are two of them. We'll tell you some of the other ones. The Isaiah passage was startling. It was stinging to the core. But added to it, Paul asserted that the salvation of God offered to the Jews was now going to be sent to the Gentiles. That did it. When the leaders heard that, they departed. And so we have the three D's of dullness. Disbelief, depart, departing, and disputed. All because of their spiritual dullness. And let me tell you something, when the Holy Spirit moves, a lot of people, even in a church, will disbelieve it. When the Holy Spirit moves, many of them will leave and say, I'm not coming back anymore. When the Holy Spirit moves, they'll dispute among themselves. Is that of God? Was that not of God? You ought to know the Spirit of God by now. Somebody say amen. But the matter did not end with leaving Paul. A great dispute is sued among them. That means that some have been convinced by Paul's preaching. We wonder how many return to listen further and through the gift of faith in the Holy Spirit join the growing church in Rome. I think a lot of them did. Let me get personal with you tonight. Let me just switch a little bit and, even, and get, to a, to get this back on center later on. I just buried a, a man, a young man, that OD'd on heroin. I can't tell you how many young men I have buried recently that have OD'd on heroin. It's been unbelievable. And it's a, extremely hard for me to tell you what's going on in this, but I want to tell it to you. When they call me up, I don't eulogize people when I, when I bury them, unless I know them real well. I did not know this man. I knew his family. I knew, that I knew his, the mother of his children, but I didn't know him. And so, basically, I let everyone say the things about him. It seems like he was a great guy. He, they said he loved God. I have no idea if he made a personal commitment to God. And I said that. I'm not his judge. I have no idea if he did that. I wish I could have talked to him about choices in life. I heard very quickly after that about another young man who was in church who shot himself and killed himself. Uh, no less than I had another one call me up and wanted me to do a funeral. I wasn't in town. Of another young man that OD'd 25, 27, and 28 years old. In the last week, it's almost an epidemic. I'm, I'm 
tired of burying young men and hearing of their untimely deaths. I told Cheryl, I says, I'd like to have, I'd like to write a play. I'd like to write a play and just go around churches. And here's what I like to do. I like to show a family. I like to march them out the mother. I like to march out the dad. Two little boys and a little girl. March them out. Then I like to show the man's work and his boss and the relationship he had with him. I like to show his co-workers. I like to bring his family in. I like to show him aging and becoming a grandfather and little grandchildren all around. And then I like to come up and say, this is the life that wasn't. And take it all off the stage and say, he died at 27. And none of this happened. It could have happened, but none of this happened. It's the life that wasn't for one choice. And by the way, lots of controversy on suicide. Suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. And you only have one chance at it. One choice. You know, how many of you ever made bad choices? I told them at that funeral, I've made bad choices. So just ask Cheryl. Somebody was sitting next to her and, she, and they said, oh, he's never made a bad choice. I don't know what Cheryl said. I don't even want to know. We all make bad choices. But the choice of suicide, you'll never get to make over again. So I see this and I'm thinking about this mindset that's going on and, and I kind of figured out why it's going on. What's going on? Listen to me. The lives that never happened. And I'm reminded every time I officiate these funerals that it could have been me. I sat in a room when people were shooting up heroin. Let me tell you something. I had no problem shooting up heroin. I didn't. You know the reason why I didn't? Because I was a clean nut. And if the needle had started with me, I probably would have done it. But there were eight people that used the same needle and I said, I'm not touching that thing. That was God. But if I would have, who knows? I mean, I even, my life may have been the life that wasn't. So I have a compassion for people. I understand what they're going through. Listen, there's lots of people who honestly believe in God. This boy, I have every reason to believe he believed in God. And I have every reason to believe he was a great guy. And by the way, most heroin, most, most uh, deaths that come from heroin overdose happen this way. They come off of heroin. And they may be off two weeks, a month, and they may be doing fine. Something happens, it's, it, it uh, sets their mind a different way, and they go back, and they, they hit up again. But the problem is, heroin, when you take it, you have to take more and more and more to get the same high. So when they come off of it, they're at a, they're at a level up here of their heroin usage of what they're taking, the dosage. When they go back on, they take that same dosage, and it immediately bursts their heart. And they die, because they can't handle it. So... We watch this and we see this mindset and maybe you can't and I can't wrap our mind around it, but it goes back to what we're studying. I'll, pr I'll show it to you. There's lots of people who honestly believe in God. I believe this boy believed in God and are great people, but they don't hear God. Let me say that again. They don't understand that life's answers are found in Him. They don't, under, they don't hear that still small voice. Just to be able to know God doesn't mean you hear God. It's very important we hear God. For one reason or another, a lot of people, even people that sit in church, don't hear God. Oh, Pastor Mark, what are you talking about? An audible voice? No, listen to me. Just listen to what I'm saying. Let's look at it honestly. And by the way, it's a great message to give right when we're ending Acts because it's something that you could take with you. Our ears are tuned to whatever our hearts, whatever holds our hearts and our minds. Tonight you came in here and there's some things on your hearts and on your mind. Your ears are geared to that. You can miss the greatest message because your, your ears are geared to something else you're thinking about. And so that happens to, to all of us. I'm putting myself in that position. So what are the primary reasons that people don't hear God, and even if they hear and don't listen to Him? What is the primary reason? Do you think if the voice of God somehow, and I'll show you how His voice comes, hit some of these young men, do you think they would have done what they did? Of course they wouldn't. The voice of God would never encourage somebody to do that. So how do you get to that spot? How do you hear God? How many want to know? Just listen to it tonight. So, number one, how do you... How do you hear God? And what are the primary reasons po people don't listen to God first? Number one, the big one, they don't have a relationship with Him. You're never going to hear God if you don't have a relationship with Him. God speaks all the time, by the way, and I'll show you how He does that in a moment. But you're never going to hear Him if you're not saved and you're, you're poking at something, poking at religion or poking at God. You're not going to hear Him. When you have a relationship with someone, you hear them. Listen, when I first saw Cheryl, I said, I have to talk to that girl. She was just a girl, 17. I said, I've got to talk to her. I want, to, I want to have a relationship with her. I could have gone in the bathroom and said, Cheryl, I want to talk to you. She could have been out in the other hall. She's never going to hear me. I've got to, have to, I've got to introduce myself. I've got to have a relationship. The born-again experience is a relationship that opens you up, not just gets you out of hell. It opens you up to the voice of God. God ought to talk to us. Come on, somebody say amen. Christianity to me isn't a religion. It's not a name tag. It's not a casual thing to me. It's, it's, a, it's a marriage between me and Christ. It's a union with covenants, bonds. 
It's with promises, requirements, responsibilities based on love. The result is joy and happiness and fulfillment in life with an active back and forth conversation. Now I want you to just find, just listen to me for a moment. And many don't have that because they're not saved. You can't get that in Islam. Il Ali is not going to talk to you. Allah is not going to talk to you. He's not going to impress anything on you. If it's from you, it's from your own feelings. Buddha is not going to do it. I don't care how much you transcendental and, and look like a lotus. It's not going to happen. You can go on a lily pad and put your fingers out like this and be a lotus and you're not going to get a message from him. It's going to come from you, but it's not going to come from him. Second, they think they don't have a relationship. Second, many people don't expect the Lord to speak to them. They think it's weird. They think that's strange that somebody can actually say that God speaks to them. They think it's weird, spooky. They think it's mental. Our world does. Guess who God is not going to speak to? Those people. He's never going to speak to them. Anyone and everyone doesn't think, think he speaks to, him, to, to people will never hear him speak. Yes, they will never hear him. Ever. Another reason, and by the way, oh, by the way, they think it's weird. They think he's very weird. Let me show you how it. Joy Bear. Celebrities call Mike Pence mentally ill for talking to God and listening to God. Well, if Mike Pence is mentally ill, so am I. And so am all of you. And maybe we should be all mentally ill. Maybe we'd be better off. But the world doesn't see that. The third reason, the message of the world drowns out God's voice. Your world is pounding at you every day. Every day. The Bible says in Galatians, there are many voices and none without significance. People are talking to you. And you have this coming on. The world's talking to you. You have, you have the news outlets talking to you. You have, the, you have all the reports coming in. You have people's opinions coming in. You have somebody who likes Trump. Somebody who doesn't like Trump. Somebody who has, who's a liberal. Somebody who's, a, who's not a liberal. Somebody who wants to back gay rights. Somebody who doesn't. You have so many voices coming. It's really confusing. Do not let the world drown out God's voice. God's voice is definitely the one that overrides the world. Our world is self-absorbed. Consider this, and I'm going to hammer this tonight. I, went on, I have Facebook, and I use Facebook. We use it for the message. I don't really put anything on myself. And Cheryl every now and then will put something on, but I don't really use it. Cheryl doesn't have Facebook. and I don't, I'm, not, I'm not beriding anyone or deriding anyone for using it. Just listen, listen to me out. And so most of my Facebook, almost all of it, 95, 98% is about these messages. They're, this is on Facebook today. So you get on my, on my Facebook spot and you'll see it. So Father's Day, I opened up my Facebook to see what message was there. And I hear all these comments about, from these women about their husbands. He's the greatest man. He lays on the floor with my children. He does this. He's this. He's that. He's this. He's that. He's this. He's that. I mean, by the time you get to the end, this guy has four halos on and he's just the best thing on the planet. I didn't say anything. Just let it go. Um, the other day, right after that, I got on and somebody's anniversary was there. And they wanted to put their anniversary picture on Facebook. And they had the anniversary. And the woman said all these glowing things about her husband. They're married for 30-some years and this and that and this and that. And at the end of it, he responds, thank you, honey, you're the best to me. And then total number of views were two. I got a suggestion for those people. Why don't you just talk to each other? Why do we do that? Why are we trying to show somebody else what we should be talking to somebody about? Why are, we, why are we using Facebook to show the world something? You know, I really get suspect when somebody puts something on Facebook. Now, you're going to get upset with me. When somebody puts all those glowing reports, I wonder if their marriage is okay. I've been married 41 years, going on 42, and I think that's right. No, okay, Cheryl, 42 years. I missed a year. I was sick. I was sick. 42 years. I'm not going to put glowing reports on Facebook about Cheryl. I'm going to tell her when we wake up in the morning how beautiful she is and how much she means to me. How many understand what I'm talking about? I'm not, listen, I'm not being judgmental here. Just listen to what I'm saying. We are, we are really, we're, the world's drowning out God's voice. It's too much about us. It really is. It's about us. You want to see how it's about us? <laughs> this, I'm going to get myself in so much trouble. You know what, though? I don't really care. Can I tell you why? I told you this before. There's two types of people that don't care what they say. The very old, because they know they're going to die. <laughs> and the people who almost died because they think they're on borrowed time. So here it is. You ready? Selfie or selfish? But mark this. Listen to what this says in 1 Timothy. There will be terrible times in the last days, I'm quoting scripture. People will be lovers of their own selves. Lovers of themselves. 
Lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of, of not, uh, unnatural lovers is what it says. When we get self-absorbed, okay, I'm going all the way. I don't care if somebody shows me a dot that they're in a certain airport. I really don't care. You checked into an airport. Does that mean you never knew how to do it before? <laughs> We're self-absorbed. And the more self-absorbed you are, the less you hear God's voice. Amen. Just listen to that. It's powerful. The more self-absorbed you are, the less... Now, I'm, again, I'm not telling you you can't share anything on Facebook. I understand that. I'm just telling you there are some people that's all they want to do. We've got to be real careful. So, number four. Still with me tonight? They don't hear God's voice because they don't think He has ever spoken to them. If I told somebody, well, God showed me something the other day, and I don't really say that to people. I don't think I have to advertise it. God spoke to me the other day. It's like, well, he never speaks to me. Of course he does. God is speaking all the time. He is yelling at us all the time, not in a bad way. He's wanting to be heard by us all the time, and I'm going to prove it to you tonight. So they, they, have, they don't recognize God's voice. There's lots of times God does something, and we don't recognize it's God. We think it's coincidence. No such thing. God speaks to us all the time. In this study, by the way, I get emails all the time. You know what the emails most of the time say? Pastor Mark, thank you. God used you to speak to me. He's speaking to them through this study. His voice is all around us. Every day it's around us. When you speak something to someone, encourage somebody, that's God's voice to them. Especially if you do it in the love of Christ. That's God's voice to them. Fifth reason. Their minds are closed to his voice. Oh, God doesn't speak anymore. I love the people that tell me, oh, it was only for the first century. Uh, the miracle is only for the first century. Baptism of the Holy Spirit, only the first century. Listen, if God is not someone who starts something and quits, Amen. He's consistent. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God speaks. Now, has that been abused? Of course it has, but I'm going to show you the truth of it in a moment. Six, and this is, the, this is the big one that gets a lot of people. God wants to speak to you, but this. People are too busy. They're too busy. We have so much drama in our life, it's not even funny. So much drama. There's some people I know, not in here, not in my Bible studies. Their drama is how, how many times they have to, have to cut their grass because it rained. And you talk to them, you talk to them, and that's the major thing they're going to talk about every time you talk to them. I cut my grass today. How's it look? It's like I did yesterday. I'm really not crazy about grass. What can I tell you? But they're drama-oriented. It's, the, it's always about what's happening around them. They're not going to hear God's voice. And here's the other one. Sometimes they may fear the message. I had people come up to me. I was preaching one, night, one, one uh, service way back in cathedral, and I had a lady come up to me, and she wouldn't look at me. It was at the altar, and she wouldn't look at me. She said, I said, look at me. She said, no, I don't, I'm afraid of what you're going to tell me. Why are you afraid of what I'm going to tell you? And, I, and God showed something to me about her. And then I knew why she was afraid, because I told her. And she said, I don't want to hear that. I said, it doesn't matter if you want to hear it. If God tells you it, you got to be open up to it. You may fear the message, but God loves you. If it's correction, it's for you. It's for to correct you and to love you. Here's the next one. Sometimes people are angry with the Lord. If you are angry with the Lord, you do not understand Christianity. The Lord is your helper. Can you imagine getting angry at the one who's going to help you? He's the one that takes you out of messes. Why would you get angry at the one who can take care of your situation? Now, I understand, oh, I don't know why God did this. Well, understand this. God doesn't let anything happen to you that's not going to ultimately work out for your purpose. So we have to understand that. The next reason, they have neglected reading and meditating on their Bible. I have one person come up to me, I've had it several times, Pastor, I don't hear anything from God. I said, how often do you read your word? Oh, I really don't read my word. What do you think? You know, that's, those are love letters to you from God. So you're saying, I don't want to read your love letters, God. And now I want you to speak to me, though. Listen, if I sent Cheryl a letter and sent her one over and over and over and over again telling her how much I loved her and she never read them and, I, and then, I, then I expected her to, to respond in a way to, to, that was amiable to me, I'm, I'm delusional. Some people have a rebellious spirit. They just don't want to hear God. I don't care about God. I don't want to hear God. The guy on the Facebook today, by the way, said all these expletives and he put God in there. Cheryl said, ooh, I wouldn't want to be in his shoes. Well, he's never going to hear anything from God. Eleven, lastly, sin has prevented them from hearing God. 
God has to bless obedience. He always has to bless obedience. So if you know that there's sin in your life and you don't confess it, and you don't want to do better on it, then you're not going to hear God. You're going to confuse the voice of God. How many are with me tonight? So tonight I want to close by telling you why we need to hear the Lord's voice. There's reasons why. And by the way, He is screaming at us. I promise you that. If, why do we need to hear the Lord's voice? When I had stage 4 cancer, this isn't me, by the way. He has a lot more hair than I do. When I had stage 4 cancer, I would sit on my dock at the lake and I'd look out at sunsets. And I would wonder if I had another one that I was going to see. And man, I was so impressed by God. He was giving me so many truths, truths that I'd never shared as far as teaching. It was just truths for me. And I felt so much, so close to Him because I was so desperate for Him. And I was hearing Him. I was just taking time out and I was listening to Him. I needed to hear His voice at that moment. There's lots of times in my life I need to hear His voice. So, why do we need to listen to the Lord's voice? Well, we need to hear His voice to have assurance of salvation. There's a lot of people who doubt their own salvation. Listen, the only way to silence doubts is to listen to the Lord. He saved us once for all time and eternity. You are saved for all time and eternity. You open your Bible up and Paul will tell you that you have boldness to enter into the throne. You need to hear the Lord's voice, the Lord's voice to know that you're alright with God. Even if you sin, you're alright with God. Because you confess it. Your sins are forgiven past, present, and future. It's when you walk away from God that they're not. How many are with me? He knows we're sinners. Salvation gives you that. We need to hear His voice to make decisions. You have got to hear His voice to make decisions. The real reason we need to hear his vo God's voice is because there's a, another powerful spiritual voice around us, which I'll show you in a moment. You need to make decisions. God's interested in every aspect of your life. He wants to guide each choice we make. Cheryl and I, for years and years, we would look at houses. We bought lots of houses. We'd look at houses, and we watch a house going up from on, on, for sale. Cheryl's a realtor. We watch it going up. It's been on the market for eight months. We have a pretty good shot of getting it. Uh, we give a pretty good offer to it. And the day we'd offer some money to it, somebody would pay for that house, either cash or just get it. After eight months, nine months, 12 months, i say, Cheryl, this is God. He's making our decisions for us. I love it when God makes my decisions. I don't have to worry about anything. He wants to make decisions. So you let him, you let him, you hear his voice. That's the only way why, the only way you can. Why do you want to hear his voice? To be encouraged. There is nobody that can encourage you like God. No one on the face of the planet. No one can encourage our hearts like the Lord, but we have to listen to him or we'll miss it. If you're only talking negative to yourself, if you're only thinking about the terrible things you have and you don't listen to his word, his word is full of encouragement. He'll speak to you. That You'll get a verse out of it and he'll speak to you. Listen, it happened to me over and over again when I was sick, when I was ill. I would get a verse of scripture and that verse would speak to me and encourage me because I wasn't getting any encouragement from the doctors or even my own body. What else? To receive comfort. We need to be reminded that He loves us unconditionally and is always ready to help us through difficult circumstances. How many of you will say, Pastor Mark, I mess up? How many would say, I'm a mess up? How many would say, sometimes spiritually I'm sick? How many would say that sometimes that sickness bothers me? Okay, turn to your neighbor and say, you are sick. Jesus came for the sick. He didn't, come for, he didn't come for the whole. He came for the sick. All, and we need him. We need to have comfort in knowing that we're not alone in this thing. Somebody say amen. amen. You need to hear his voice to be strengthened. Strengthened. Whenever we need the will, determination, and confidence to keep going, God can strengthen us. I can't tell you how important that was for me lying in a hospital room, dying. Literally dying. That my strength didn't come from the doctor's reports. Cheryl was a comfort to me. But Cheryl couldn't infuse strength in me. She could just quote scripture to me, which she did constantly. And that scripture just encouraged me so much. It just strengthened me. I could feel my spirit getting stronger and stronger. By the way, the proverb says that. It says, the spirit of a man will sustain him in his sickness. And my spirit was, more, was stronger than my body ever was. That's because we're hearing the voice of God. What, else, what other reason? To know the Father's will. When we're seeking to understand His will, we must stop talking and listen to hear His voice. There's something about being quiet. I'm speaking to the choir, which is myself. There's something about just not talking sometimes. There's something about just letting God impress upon you things. Now, just listen to me for a moment. I want to give you a, an example. The other day, a family member called me and said to me, uh, told me to pray for another member of the family. And because there was a lump on that family's, uh, on the other member's uh, br chest, breast, and that that person was going for a mammogram, and they were all worried, and they wanted me to pray. I was driving down 280, 
So I prayed. My eyes were open. I wasn't on my knees. I didn't have my hands like this. You don't have to do that. God is everywhere. Why do we look up if God's everywhere? You can pray. I prayed. I felt it. I prayed. And immediately, God spoke to me and said, call them back up and tell them that it's a sebaceous cyst. Now, that is not just an encouraging word. That is a diagnosis. There's a hundred different types of cysts you can have. And, and the person, outside the family, the person, I, I say family, it wasn't immediate, it's outside. Uh, the person's really not someone who really thinks about prayer a whole lot. And so I called the person back up who asked me, and I said, it's a sebaceous cyst. I know what they thought. You're an idiot. I said, it's a sebaceous cyst. The Lord impressed upon me, it's a sebaceous cyst. Now, most cysts, 55% are cancerous. About 45 are benign. A sebaceous cyst is benign. It does nothing. It's just a cyst that goes away. Well, the person said, well, they're getting tests, and uh, we'll know in two days. I was so sure, and then I hung up, I, I closed my phone, and I thought, what if I'm wrong? And then I got a check. Do you trust me? I'm telling you this. And so I got a call two days later. You're never going to believe it. It was a sebaceous cyst. <laughs> They wanted to know the Father's will. They were worried that their life, you now one sentence can change your life, that it's cancer. They want to know the Father's will. Well, he actually used me to tell them that will. Now, they got comfort in initially, but the more you do that, the more you understand that, the more it's going to bring comfort to you to know the will of God. And also, you want to hear his voice to receive God's best. Jesus always does what's best when we wait for his direction and heed his instruction. If there's a doubt, don't. Wait till God speaks something to you. Wait till he tells you. And the benefit from his protection. When we follow the Lord's guidance and make good choices, he prote protects us from wrong relationships and wrong activities. Now, why do you need to hear God's voice? There's one more reason. Because there's another voice trying to impress you. God's voice calms. Satan's voice obsesses. God's voice comforts. Satan's voice brings you worry. God's voice convicts. Satan's voice condemns. God's voice encourages. Satan's voice discourages. God's voice enlightens. Satan's voice confuses. God's voice leads. Satan's voice pushes. God's voice reassures. Satan's voice frightens. God's voice stills. Satan's voice rushes. There used to be a cartoon when I was young, and you've probably seen it. A guy's trying to do something. He's making a decision, and there's a little devil that appears on one so shoulder, and there's a little angel that appears on the other shoulder. I don't let the devil get on my shoulder. I kick him off as soon as he tries to get there. I, have, I want both angels on my shoulder. I don't want to have, hear the enemy's voice. And by the way, we speak the enemy's voice to ourselves sometimes. I can't do this. I don't know what's happening. I'm, I'm, I'm upset. I, we, get it, we, get, uh, we get our society, our media, our unsaved mindset, the doubt, depression, hurts, troubles. We all face those things. So what I'm here to tell you tonight as I get ready to close is this. The Lord's voice. The Lord's voice. Listen to what the Bible says. When the Israelites saw the thunderings and lightnings upon Mount Sinai and heard the Lord's voice declare the Ten Commandments, they were afraid. Fear not. Moses' words were meant to inspire their reverence and awe towards God and to motivate them to resist sin. Do you know what the Israelites did? God wanted to speak the Ten Commandments to all the Israelites. They were so afraid that they sent Moses up to get them. You don't need to be afraid of God's voice. God's voice is to bring us to that next level. Psalm 29, verse 1 and 9 is God's voice in the storm. You're going to hear it most in the storm. You're going to hear it most when you're desperate. I want you to read, uh, to listen to Psalm 120, uh, 29, 1-9. Praise the Lord, you angels of His. Praise His glory and His strength. Praise Him for the majestic the glory, the glory of his name. Come before him clothed in sacred garments. The voice of the Lord echoes from the clouds. The God of glory thunders through the skies. So powerful is his voice, so full of majesty, it breaks down the cedars. By the way, it's the cedars of Lebanon. It splits the giant trees of Lebanon. It shakes Mount Lebanon and Mount Sirion. They leap and skip before him like calves. The voice of the Lord thunders through the lightning. It resounds through the deserts. It shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord spins and topples the mighty oaks. It strips the forest bare. They whirl and sway beneath the blast. But in his temple, all are praising glory, glory to the Lord. The voice of the Lord is what we need tonight. We don't need another religious service. We don't need another sermon. We don't even need another teaching. What we need is to hear the voice of the Lord. If the voice of the Lord goes out of here with you tonight, then you're going to be most assured that God is going to take every one of your steps and put it in the right direction. I think the voice of the Lord is the greatest thing you can have when you are saved. I want you to understand that. I want you to understand that the voice of the Lord is powerful. His voice is mighty. His voice is 
is thunderous. I want you to understand everything about him. Can you hear me here? Do you understand that his voice is mighty? It's powerful. It's everything you need in life. Can you hear me yet? I am speaking directly to you. That's the way you ought to hear his voice. It's a megaphone that shouts over every single thing we hear in our life. I told you this last week, so I'll tell it to you one more time and give it to you one more time. Winston Churchill said a bunch of things. One of the things he said was, now this is not the beginning, not the end. It's not even the beginning of the end, but it's perhaps the end of the beginning. What does that mean? Well, the church is just being pushed out. It's not the end. We're going we're gonna to end this next week, but that's not the end of the church. It's not, even the, it's not even the beginning of the end. It's the end of the beginning. That was the beginning of the church. The end is coming somewhere down the line, and you're part of it. So tonight, I want you to just listen to me. Then I heard the voice saying, Whom shall I send, O Lord? Who will go for us? He says, Send me. Here I am. Send me. Tonight, you are entrusted with the voice of God. You're entrusted. Do you know that world needs what you have? Plan A. You are God's plan A. He has no plan B for the world. Our world is divided. We have a polarized America. We have people having opinions on this side and that side. Let me give you a suggestion. Don't get in the fray of opinions. Just tell them about what the Lord says. You tell them about the Lord and let me tell you something. You're going to soar and God's going to bless you. Would you bow your heads with me tonight for a moment? Let me ask a question. Who among us tonight whether you're here or listening at home somewhere, Facebook or YouTube, would say, man, I just need to, I need to hear God. Raise your hand. I have a decision coming up and I need to hear God. Raise your hand. Hands going up all over. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about what I'm saying tonight. Pray about it. God, I want to be open to your voice. And then tomorrow, I want you to think of everything that happens to you during that day and see God in it. I want you, what are you trying to tell me, God? What are you trying to show me? I want you to read your word. Open it up. You don't have to read 10 chapters. You don't have to read two and a half hours. All you need to do is read one verse of scripture, two verses, let it sink in and say, God, I'm ready to hear you today. If you, if you start your day with that mindset, God's, you're going to hear God speaking to you. Would you stand with me as I pray? Father, I thank you tonight. I thank you for your people, Lord God. I thank you for everyone that's listening to this message. I thank you, Lord God, that you always want to speak to us. It's always to encourage us, to strengthen us, to lift us up, to give us direction, Lord God, to help us make decisions, Lord God, to assure us of our salvation. You always want to talk to us. Tonight, Lord God, there are many that are here, many that are listening, Lord, that need your voice. And I know it's there, Lord God. Open our ears. Those Jews did not have their ears open. They didn't have their eyes seeing, Lord God. You were speaking to them all through the prophets. You were speaking to them from a man right in front of them that was telling them the, the actual truth and they couldn't hear him, Lord God. Help us not to be dull of hearing, Lord God. Help us not to be distracted, Lord God. Help us to hear your voice clearly, Lord, whether it's concerning our children, our finances, our marriages, our grandchildren, Lord God, where we should, where we should go today or tomorrow. Help us to hear your voice. Be our guide, Lord. I know you want to. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Amen.